When we look at the ore grades that exist for uranium, we see that they range from a high of over 20% to as low as 0.007%. Of all the ore grades proven and inferred to exist, 30% of them are greater than 0.1% in purity, leaving 70% below the grade of 0.1%. Only one country, Canada, has proven reserves at a higher grade than 1%, while 11 countries have already entirely exhausted their uranium ores. When we consider ore grades in such extremely low concentrations, the mining yields are quite dramatic, but not in a good way. Here's where 70% of the known uranium reserves lie, requiring that anywhere from 500 pounds to 10,000 pounds of ore body be removed and processed to obtain a single pound of the mineral, uranium oxide. Clearly, as with copper, we are slipping down a slope of declining ore concentrations for uranium, and it cannot be disputed that greater energy and cost is demanded at this end of the curve. Just in the sake of interest, France gets 90% of its electricity from nuclear power, but their uranium extraction peaked in the late 1980s, while the U.S. passed its mining peak in the early 1980s. Both countries are well past peak uranium. If uranium is the energy of the future, the future lies somewhere outside of these two countries. In fact, this same general theme naturally applies to anything we humans set our attention to. Phosphorus, uh, essential mineral for farming, uh, fish in the oceans, and every single source of metal are all telling the same story. We are running out of high-grade materials. For most things, there is either already a shortage or one will soon arise within the next few decades. And even these assessments assume that sufficient energy exists allowing us to dig as many mile-deep pits as we wish in our quest for the last low-grade ores. The story here is that we as a species all over the globe have already mined the richest ores found the easiest energy sources, and farmed the richest soils. It is said that for every bushel of wheat taken to market, a bushel of topsoil is lost. In that sense, given that it takes hundreds of years to form a single inch of topsoil, it can be said that our farmers are actually mining the soil. We have taken several hundreds of millions of years of natural ore body and energy deposition, and thousands of years of soil creation, and largely burned through them in the few years since oil was discovered. It is safe to say that in human terms, once these are gone, man, they're gone. Another measure of human activity is that certain sensitive ecosystem stress markers are showing up. Species loss is one example, but there are many others, such as the dead zones that are appearing all over the globe in the shallow seas. In fact, if one cares to look, there are red lights flashing all over our collective dashboard, ranging from species loss to oceanic depletion to aquifer depletion to topsoil loss, energy depletion, and so on. When I get even one red warning light on my dashboard, I pull right over to see what's wrong. So far, my sense is that the world is stepping on the gas pedal instead. And driving every single bit of this is simply this. 70 million new people arrive on the surface of the planet each year. This means that a stunning 50% increase in the number of humans clamoring for natural resources will have to be negotiated over the next 40 years. If we get clever about this, my sense is that we can do just fine. If we simply choose to grow, though, because that's what our money system requires, and that's the default position for our politicians, then it seems likely that we'll simply go faster until we hit a wall. The choice seems clear. Either we undertake voluntary change now, or we face involuntary change later. Now, back to the economy. It's primary assumption that the future will not just be bigger, but exponentially bigger than the present, is going to have to contend with this reality. I submit to you that these limits are going to play out in very real terms over the next 20 years. And so we can finally put all three E's into one spot. Our economy is based on an exponential money system that explicitly enforces a paradigm of continuous growth and implicitly assumes that the future will be much larger than the present. Growth requires energy. There's no getting around that. So the trends in energy stand in stark contrast to the major underlying assumption upon which our entire economy and our entire way of life are founded. Peak energy is a very real, very close prospect. In the rest of the environment, we see very clearly that we humans have high-graded virtually every resource, and we are now working our way into poorer, thinner, and deeper territory as we seek the resources that define our lifestyles. Biosystem stress is flashing warning signs on our dashboard, pretending that we can just carry on consuming as we have, while the world population increases by another 50% over the next 40 years is just not a workable plan. In fact, it's no plan at all. The continued exponential extraction of resources is a difficult enough story to believe just given the depleting ore grades that we are witnessing.
But when we combine that reality with what we know about our energy supplies, then the story becomes even more unworkable. Because each of the key environmental resources upon which we depend, metals and minerals, soil, water, oceanic fish, and all the rest, have been high graded, their continued extraction is going to increasingly be in competition for dwindling energy supplies that we'd also like to use to transport ourselves to construct buildings and to stay warm. Taken together, it becomes quite clear that our challenge is to adapt to a world of less, not more. A world where we have to put more energy into carefully managing what we have than seeking out new sources to exploit. We have an economic system that must grow, coupled to an energy system that can't grow, both of which are linked to a world of rapidly depleting resources. Out of the three E's, this is the one that is going to be doing the changing, and you need to be ready for that. That's what this entire crash course has been about. Let me make this even simpler. I want to be sure to get this point across very clearly. Our economy must grow to support a money system that requires growth, but is challenged by an energy system that can't grow, and both of these are linked to a natural world that is rapidly being depleted. Let me close by saying that if I thought these represented unfixable problems, I would not have dedicated full-time the last four years of my life developing this crash course and raided my bank account to make it freely available to all. I am an optimist, and I want a better future of our own design. We can no longer afford pleasant platitudes about 250 years of coal left without appreciating the actual details involved. It's time to think big develop a clear sense of priorities, and cast off the adolescent view that nothing bad is going to happen to us because so far it hasn't. And it's time to show that we care about future generations. For better or worse, you happen to be alive at one of the most dramatic turning points in our species history that ranks right up there with climbing down out of the trees. The only real question is, what role do you want to play? Shall your life be filled with fear or a resolute sense of purpose? The only way these challenges can become insurmountable is if we let them by ignoring them for too long. Okay, it's time to place all of these challenges onto a single timeline so that we can assess the urgency of the risks that we face. Please join me for Chapter 19, Future Shock. Thank you for your attention. You are now at that part of the crash course where everything you learn comes together into a single spot. What I am offering is a comprehensive view of how all our problems are actually interrelated and need to be viewed as such, or solutions will continue to elude us. So let's review the key trends which appear to be converging on a very narrow window of the future. We began with an understanding of money, and the fact that our money is loaned into existence, with interest, and that this results in powerful pressures to keep the amount of credit, or money, constantly growing by some percentage every year. This is the very definition of exponential growth, which we can easily see in our money and, of course, inflation charts. Keeping this dynamic in mind, we encountered the data on debt, which is really a claim on the future, vastly exceeding all historical benchmarks. The flip side to this, but a significant sociological trend in its own right, is the steady erosion of savings observed over the exact same period of time. Combined, we have the highest levels of debt ever recorded coincident with some of the lowest levels of savings ever recorded. And we saw that our failure to save extends through all levels of our society and even includes a desperate failure to invest in our infrastructure. Next, we saw how assets, primarily housing, have been in a sustained bubble, and that is now bursting and will take many years to play out. When credit bubbles burst, they result in financial panics that end up destroying a lot of capital. Actually, that's not quite right. This quote says it better. Panics do not destroy capital. They merely reveal the extent to which it has been previously destroyed by its betrayal into hopelessly unproductive works. So we learn that a bursting bubble is not something that's easily fixed by authorities because their attempts to limit further damage are misplaced. The damage has already been done. It is contained within too many houses and too many strip malls sold for too high prices and too many goods imported and bought on credit. All of that is done. All that's left is figuring out who ends up holding the bag, and right now, these guys are working hard to assure that that's you, the taxpayer.